I'm uh, CJ Newbern, and I'm uh, one of the, uh, the architect for Magnum IO. Uh, Jensen came up with this uh, acronym of multi GPU multi node. And I've been driving a lot of our efforts uh, for security in the data center, one of the CUDA architects. Today, I'd like to talk a little bit about a technology that I helped architect called uh, GPU direct storage. So gone are the days when our data sets could fit inside uh, a given node, uh, much less a given component of a GPU or CPU. They've really scaled out. And so as things are that large, uh, and they really need to uh, be accelerated in terms of how you're gonna process them. They're coming from uh, remote and distributed systems and need to be fed into these GPUs. And increasingly, IO is really, storage IO is really the bottleneck. So we invented this technology that we have. Uh, essentially, one of the weaknesses in existing Linux is that if you want to be able to uh, bring data in, it's fine if you want to bring it into CPU memory, but you can't bring it directly into the GPU memory using POSIX. And so you need something special to be able to do that. If you have to go and make a trip up to the CPU, into the CPU's memory, and then come back down to the GPU, as you can imagine, uh, you can have a number of uh, bottlenecks there. Uh, some of those can be bandwidth, some of those can be latency, but one of the others is that you're burning a lot of CPU cycles. Um, in some tests that we've done with VAST, we basically found that uh, we were able to 3x each of those. 3x the bandwidth, uh, one-third the latency, and one-third of the CPU load. And that's a significant gain that a lot of folks are really enjoying. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, a number of those uh, benefits. In a system like a DGXA100, uh, CPUs are limited in their connectivity down to the GPUs, but we have a switch that's in the middle, and so you can take a shortcut directly from the NICs uh, straight into the GPUs without having to go up to the CPU, and that already gives you a 2x or more benefit. So we essentially, this is one of the uh, major changes that we've made to CUDA lately to add file. Uh, we have a new... Uh, uh, sort of keyword of ku file that we've added to this. And uh, we support a, a wide variety of different local and remote file systems uh, and interfaces. You were talking about NVMe over F, that's an example. Um, and uh, so this is, a, again, something that uh, is all on the client. It uh, doesn't involve anything on the server as long as the server supports RDMA. We have a significant uh, partners, a set of partners that we have uh, that have sort of GA'd their products. And VAST is one of the early ones for this. And uh, so many of these have been shipping and we have go through a process of vetting those and checking the performance and so on. And uh, uh, we've gone through that with all of these. So essentially the normal thing you do without this is something like a POSIX P read. Uh, that you use to bring things into the memory and then a CUDA mem copy to get it back down into GPU memory. Uh, so we've imitated the POSIX P read in these uh, new instructions that we have of CUDA file read and CUDA file write. Um, and applications can make those changes directly or uh, many of the different application frameworks are already using some middleware that we've enabled. So uh, this is true for visualization, and I'll show you an example with this. Um, NVIDIA has a bunch of uh, different uh, specific application libraries uh, for different application domains, uh, such as in health. Uh, we'll show you some uh, QSIM work um, for data analytics, like with Rapids uh, and Spark and MB Tabular coming online. I'll show you some things that we've done uh, in genomics in this space. Then also, of course, the DL frameworks uh, that have been enabled that use a data loader called Dolly that's been enabled uh, to be able to do this. So uh, there are, in many cases, applications don't need to do anything if they're already using enabled middleware, which is a, a very powerful thing. Your and libraries uh, re-implement all the scatter gather that you uh, get rid of when you turn the IOMMU off? Uh, so the IOMMU um, is basically if you would have to, so we, the DMA is already doing that for you, right? So you don't, uh, the, IOM, the IOMMU isn't inhibiting that. I, no, I, I understand that. And I understand why you have to turn the IOMMU off. I'm just I'm wondering if you've re-implemented it all, the scatter gather. It's, okay. it's already part of the DMA naturally. Okay. So we're just, this is all about enabling the DMA engines in 
the NIC or in the storage to be able to DMA directly into GPU memory instead of doing it into CPU memory. So all of the scatter gather that that does is already there. Okay, and so we have a number of different uh, frameworks and readers uh, that are also enabled in this space. So I'll talk a little bit about our track record for storage IO. Um, so uh, I'll just show a visualization here uh, that we did uh, for supercomputing last year uh, for looking at tornado visualization. There's a huge amount of data. And with this, you can basically zoom in and look at uh, sort of whatever perspectives you want inside the storm clouds um, and pretty cool stuff. And so the idea here is to be able to do more or less interactive real-time visualization, which you could not do, uh, the level of speedups that we got at this are about 8x uh, from using GDS. Uh, we've been doing some things, working with some partners in oil and gas, and uh, there you're very often uh, lim bandwidth limited. And so uh, they've been able to see uh, 2x and more speedups in that space. Uh, some things in the genotyping where you have a lot of large files uh, that may be compressed. Um, where the compute is an extremely small fraction of the workload and it's uh, the runtime is really dominated by the storage IO. And you're doing a variety of uh, different kinds of uh, operations, but a, a join basically uh, doesn't take very much time. And so for these cases, if you look at throughput, bigger is better. Um, relative to the standard tools that we have, um, uh, when you use the CUDF, the standard uh, rapids uh, framework enabled with GDS, you're getting uh, sort of multi-X speedups with this. Uh, in the health area, uh, there's uh, something called QSIM, which is a Ku Clara image. And that's a toolkit uh, that provides this accelerated IO for image processing. It's basically reading in TIFF files. Um, and so the changes that you're making to this, um, uh, you're basically uh, in, and this is done um, in Python, um, we have some of these frameworks uh, that basically uh, with a, a small number of changes here for what you're doing are able to get uh, some significant performances as a, this varies as a, a function of the file sizes, um, but even for fairly small uh, file sizes, um, we're getting some significant speed ups upwards of 2x. Excuse me, just to be clear, because I, I, I'm not familiar with it. So you provide, of course, the, the protocol, the, you know, the specification and everything, VAS provides compatibility. Okay, so I, theoretically, except for performance that VAS can give me and the capacity, for me is totally, uh, let's say, trans transparent. Yep. That's okay, exactly so I, I, I can switch a traditional storage that is already, uh, is compatible or not compatible with GPU Direct <clears throat> tomorrow, and just by enabling a couple of tweaks in my software, I can get a you know a huge speed bump. That's exactly right. Okay, it's fun actually to be you know I I was a microarchitect for a lot of years and you work really hard to get a ten or maybe even twenty percent improvement. It's fun when you can get multi x uh, improvements. But uh, on our side, we didn't have to do anything, right? It's just an NFS over RDMA server that is being presented to these Nvidia machines, and so CJ and his team, along with us, we kind of worked on NFS over RDMA to make it suitable for GPU direct storage. And that's work that the industry can benefit from. It's not exclusive to VAST. Right. No, oh, yes. In, fa in fact, you know, everybody talks about democratization of uh, machine learning. Yep. But, but it's always difficult to understand what democratization means because I agree. if you have to do too much work to, to change something that is already in place, then it, right. it's not democratized at all. So in the, you know, there, there are people like John Stone, if you've heard of him uh, in HPC, who managed to do the enabling in an afternoon. So he's a rare individual. Um, but uh, the level of effort that it's taken a number of folks to be able to uh, do this enabling is, is relatively small. So one other exciting area, we keep adding more and more domains where we have different folks that have some sort of a reader of different formats of data. A lot of climate and other multidimensional data is stored in a format called ZAR. And so this is something that we did just in the last few weeks to be able to enable this. Um, this is also something uh, you can watch for some things that's used in microscopy. And so we have some exciting uh, microscopy uh, stuff that's coming forward with
So I'll talk just a little bit about uh, some of the things that um, Alon um, Horev uh, from BAST has done uh, or is talking about. Um, this is actually his slide from a different presentation. So one of the things that BAST did in this space and has uh, contributed and upstream to the community is this ability to uh, be able to support multiple paths. So if you have multiple devices, uh, that are uh, bringing in remote storage, then they can uh, essentially move the data that way. So uh, we have this ability to be able to, uh, essentially you can have your data wherever it needs to, and you can use which have a failover uh, and do load balancing and be able to bring the data directly to the NIC that's closest to wherever your buffer is. So that's pretty cool. Uh, I'll talk briefly about the uh, security note here. Um, so one of the things that uh, we've introduced that we think is we're kind of a data center company and we care about whole solutions. And so one of the things that uh, we've been doing is looking at how can you add security when you go to access storage? What happens if an application container uh, breaks out of its container and roots the, the node and that node becomes untrusted? How is it that you can communicate more securely with either uh, local or remote storage? How do you uh, evaluate the connection deal with the translation of the file spec into the block or key or whatever it is, um, and uh, avoid something like a denial of service attack. Um, so one of the things that uh, uh, VAST is uh, looking at in this space is uh, with NFS, you're not actually doing the translation of the file spec down to something like a block inside the compute node. You're pushing that towards uh, the NFS filer. And uh, something that BAST is exploring is essentially being able to uh, not just uh, t sort of take whatever the UAD and GID uh, for user and group ID that are sent to it with the request, but to check that in a context sensitive way to say, it was that user scheduled to be on this node. So the checking is uh, uh, context sensitive uh, to that. So there's some exciting developments in this space that we're doing with our uh, Bluefield DPUs. And I'll uh, kind of wrap up with uh, sort of life after POSIX. So uh, there are a lot of folks that in HPC in particular that have been using files for a long time. But uh, if you look at where thing, folks are in the enterprise, they're not using files. They're using objects or um, uh, key value stores. So there's some downsides uh, of things in the files uh, that are addressed in, uh, by doing things on the object side. Uh, and I'll kind of walk through uh, some examples with that. But with object, you can get some better scaling. Um, there can be some uh, trade-offs that you have here with respect to performance and um, uh, sort of being more oriented towards write once, read many. So something that often happens in different environments is that you're bringing in lots of traded data. Okay, and that training data is uh, Im largely immutable. So uh, the sort of the base case is that you bring it in and stage it into your local storage. Uh, that's sort of the, the first step. And um, so uh, the with that, if it's once it's local, you don't need to re uh, load the uh, sort of remote file mount uh, into your container. Um, and you only move that big data over a slow connection once. Um, and then you send, uh, you just kind of randomly sample that uh, from the SSD lots of times. So there's a downside to that though, in that you're having to um, make this copy. Um, and so uh, you essentially, uh, you're, it's good that you're being able to bring it in and it's good that you can use now GPU direct storage to get it directly from that local storage. But the bad thing is you still have to do that local copy. Um, so you could uh, eventually skip that staging entirely and sort of bring in those objects directly into GPU memory um, and uh, that you can use it there uh, from the remote storage if you have a fast network and you have fast enough storage. Thankfully, we know some people that have some pretty fast storage. Um, and so uh, there are uh, some limitations here of like people will use S3 buckets for this, um, but that's not really standardized. And what's on the remote end doesn't necessarily use RDMA. So we're looking at and exploring solutions in this space and uh, looking at some of our internal customers in NVIDIA and looking to partner with others outside to uh, look at and explore uh, some opportunities in this space. And BAST has again been helpful in hooking us up with some customers that are interested there. The last thing I'd like to talk about is uh, a notion of data as a service. I don't know if you all have kids, but if you ask a kid, uh, you know, hey, what, you know, what, what is it that you're looking at? 
uh, you know, what, what data are you looking at? They're not going to give you a tuple that says, well, it has this name, it has this offset, and it has that size, right? That's not a very natural thing for them to do. What you might like is to say, just get me my data, whether it's local or remote, whether it's in memory or storage, and uh, to have a seamless uh, set of services for caching and prefetching and monitoring and so on. And so we're looking at an exploring, we did QFile, what's next? What are the next things that we want to do? Should those also be added to CUDA? And uh, how can we unify those approaches with uh, QFile APIs? Um, and we're, we always uh, sort of drive these investigations that we do with real world use cases that are going to enable people to do things that they just couldn't do before. And so uh, we always welcome uh, your use cases uh, and would like to partner with other folks. So NVIDIA is obviously doing, uh, making a lot of investments in storage and a lot of uh, very involved in storage. But all throughout this presentation, it sounded like you're really focused more on enabling partners to connect into the NVIDIA ecosystem and connect with NVIDIA storage. Uh, so from a strategy perspective, is that how we should read uh, NVIDIA's intentions with regard to storage that you're trying to make it easier, maybe more on the client <coughs> side? And uh, so that you can participate more with partners uh, like Vast. Correct. Or are you going? We are to not a storage vendor and have no intentions of being one. So you followed my train of thought. Okay, great. Thank you for that. All right. Thank you so much.